So, you want to be a better trader, better investor, make more profits, or just get a better understanding of the financial markets? This is the podcast for you. You are listening to Traders of Money, brought to you by Trade Delicious. Now your host, Jordan Mellor. I deal with a lot of traders day in, day out at the firm. We work with a whole range of, of from day traders to scalpers to swing traders. And probably the most prominent issue that traders are having, or at least that I notice, is on the psychological side. And that is why I'm so excited to, to chat to you today, Mandy, because your specialty and your expertise is in helping these traders progress through these emotional and mental struggles which we face which are remarkable and sometimes baffling in how in depth it can go to to overcome some of these issues what is it about performance coaching that just seems to hit the nail on the head when it comes to trading because most other careers they seem to be pretty cruisy when it comes to to the mental side of things but trading just unlocks the door to i mean a whole new jungle yeah well um trading playing golf they both have one thing in common. It's just you and the instrument that you're working with. And so, you know, at the beginning, I'm sure you have done the same because we are just human. We find all kinds of reasons why we can't perform. Mm -hmm. And then the day of reckoning comes when you look in the mirror and it's like, yeah, it's me. It can only be me because I'm the common denominator. No matter which instrument I trade, no matter which broker I use, no matter which um, time of the day or time frame or analysis tool I use, it must be me. So um, in other areas of life, the same problems occur, the same challenges take place. But there's so many influencing factors like other people, like a boss, like, you know, the environment, like um, COVID and Ukraine war, you name it, we find a reason excuse why we can't be our best. And I was talking to someone um, and he's like, I can't exercise enough because I work from eight in the morning till eight at night. And so, you know, it's not that he should exercise. It's like, if he doesn't exercise, his health is at risk, his life mm. is at risk. And still he is not stepping up and finding new uh, reasons and excuses why he can't. In trading, we run out of excuses really quick. And that's then where the coaching comes in. Yeah, no, I, I definitely can relate to excuses. Um, mm -hmm. Early days, you'd find any reason on why it wouldn't work. or, And it, it is quite, I found, a confrontational path once you start to yeah. accept that it, you're the issue. It's it's mm -hmm. a funny balance um, to try and understand. Now, I, I didn't have any professional help when undergoing my journey. And by far, my journey's not done. I don't think in trading, your journey's ever done. Mm -hmm. um, what are some of the, the most common issues you see through traders um, when, when they reach out needing some help or when they're struggling to find that consistency mark? Yeah, I find that the common issues between traders who aspire to pass the prop firm challenges and become a funded trader are a little bit different to the traders who do the journey on their own. And again, very differently to the traders who are professional traders who already work for like, you know, prop firms, in-house prop firms, yeah. um, banks, institutions, um, hedge funds. So the challenges are very different. Um, on the surface level, they seem to be the same, right? Um, I cut my profits short. I let my losses run. I um, jump into trades. I go on tilt and I'm martingale. I, yeah. These are always the questions that traders come to me with. Um, how can I stop myself from doing the stupid thing that destroys my trading career? I know I have all it takes. I'm capable. I have studied. I'm working hard and yet I don't get anywhere. That is like the common um, outcry. Outcry is yeah. a fabulous word for it because it really is. There's so much pain associated with it. And then from whatever the symptom on the top is, so whatever that behavior is, depending on the trader's individual circumstances and life experiences and, and frame of um, or your trading context, 
we then need to drill into different areas of what the root cause of this um, outcome is that they don't wish to have and how to help them going on the path where they get the outcome, um, you know, that, that they're aiming for. Mm -hmm. right? when, is, when you say, when you say drilling into the root cause, how in depth are we going here for, for traders that have never even thought about getting into trading psychology or, or diving into having that performance coach, where are you looking? Like, are you diving deep into like childhood levels, uh, maybe different ways you've been brought up traumas? Like, where are you looking yeah. as a, as a coach to, to help uplift your traders? So that's why I call myself now a performance coach and not a mindset coach, because mm -hmm. performance includes mindset. And what I found at the beginning, I was just doing mindset, right? The traditional, I'm a traditionally trained coach, um, professional coach, um, have not studied psychology, but you know, we study psychology anyway, right? Yeah. Like, um, we read all the reports and we read all the, um, um, you know, new findings with the MRI scans and so on. So, um, we don't have a university degree, but we still studied on some level. Mm -hmm. So, um, I solely looked into what is it that, um, causes traders not to perform. And we know the traditional um, neuro-linguistic programming um, model of communication where we have heaps of information coming at us. And then the brain filters out all the information, depending on what um, article you read, it's 2 million or 20 million or 200 million of information. Doesn't matter, right? It's a lot of information. But we also know that our brain can only process a small amount, I think they call it seven chunks, which is like um, tiny compared yeah. to like a drop in the water compared to an ocean. Now, how does the brain filter out this information? It is um, our beliefs, our values, our memories, how we relate to our um, external world, our self image, our identity. Yeah, so self image identity is a little bit different. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, I think it's like seven or eight different filters. And then these filters define how we feel and what we think and how we feel and what we think then depend, uh, defines what actions we take. And so that's the traditional um, approach of coaching. I found that it took me a long time to get my traders to succeed. You know, there's just so much work to be done around emotions and you can do your emotional mapping until the cows come home and you still don't have the result that you want because there's one crucial element missing. Mm. Sometimes it's actually not a mindset problem, <laughs> but it's a self-image identity problem because they feel so bad about themselves that they think it's a mindset problem. Right, so okay. then I look at their, so that's where the performance part comes in. I look at how they analyze and look at their trades. So very often traders come to me and say, man, you know, I cut my profits short again. And you saw that actually I had a trader coming to me, um, la was it last week? Well, I think it was last week. Mm -hmm. So the Dow did a double bottom. And then um, there was three sideways days um, after the first big day up. And he closed his long, even though he was saying that's going to be a double bottom. But then it was like a doji candle and um, three sideways days. He didn't trust himself anymore. Convinced him his out. way out of the position. And then you know what happened, right? 2,000 points later. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and he's so angry and frustrated and in, in enormous pain, outcry. Mm. But that wasn't a mindset problem. It was partially a mindset problem. But most more so, he did not know how to distinguish between a um, um, reversal pattern and a mean reversion or when the market is making a pause. Mm -hmm. And so that's where I started. And, and I'm like, if you know how to distinguish between those two behavioral patterns in the markets, how do candles look differently? How do your indicators behave differently when you have a reversal compared to a mean reversion? Only if they know that and they still don't follow their plan, then I look into mindset and I found the results are much faster. Interesting. So you see a lot of people out crying um, in, in help because they feel like they're self-sabotaging or they feel like they're not getting to where they want to be because of their mindset or because of their emotions. But realistically, sometimes it's just down to 
the technical aspects on, on their yeah. actual trading plan and how they're trading it. It's you like before you even get to that emotional level, you find that yeah. a lot. A way. lot, a lot. And um, so they're crying out loud. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And what leads them to this um, behavior and thinking that it's them, it's their negative self image, right? So often what I do with it hand in hand, I and they don't know about that, right? I do that on a subliminal level, a little bit sneaky. I teach them that they actually um, are better than they see themselves as, that they're more capable, that they have more resources. So I was working with a trader yesterday and he's like, I said to him, you know, what does lo a losing trade mean to you? And he's like, man, you know, I always screw up. I can't trust myself. And I was like, yeah, I can see that, you know, 15 times the same mistake over and over again. I get how you feel like that about yourself. But what is it that you can trust in yourself? And then we came to that he's resourceful in finding help and working through his problems because he has a very screwed up childhood, you know, mm -hmm. and, and, um, the behavioral patterns that he showed today were due to what he was conditioned at in childhood. And no wonder he has this negative self image. And so teaching him that he's actually not as bad as he thinks he is came with, Hey, you know, the only thing is look at your indicators. What do they look differently here? When was a reversal to here? When was a mean reversion? And so that for them is less confronting than needing to go back into childhood. Mm -hmm. Now, if that is not enough, so they know what to do, but don't do what they know, then we go into childhood. Yeah, that, then you start facing the hard rocks. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. No, that's that's it's fascinating to understand how you can you can break down essentially and analyze a trader's performance and and find out exactly whether it's an emotional issue, whether it's a childhood issue, whether it's a whatever it might be, um, yeah. even down to self image from. You're just doing the technicals wrong. You're just not trading right, and you've got to find that balance and then and then rebuild them once you discover that. It's it's very fascinating to me. I, I love chatting about this type of stuff. Um, when it comes into like prop firm traders as a whole, I understand you do coach a couple of prop firm traders or, or aspiring prop. I firm had traders. so many recently, <laughs> <laughs> which what, is exciting. I love it, right? Yeah, yeah. What mm -hmm. what do you see? As you mentioned before, there's a big difference between your retail traders, your institutional traders, and then your, your your online prop firm traders. What are the challenges you're noticing within these these prop firm traders that they're facing? Where where are the struggles, and and is there is there a common struggle within there? Yeah, yeah. So two common um, patterns. So one is. Um, and I did a lot of research also on your website. I think it's phenomenal what the Fivers did there in terms of um, posting on how traders actually succeeded in the challenge. There's one common denominator. They all have an equity curve that goes steady up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now there's a few who have a little bit like drawdowns and then a steady up. I would be interested in if they managed to stay in the challenge or if they got kicked out in the second or third round, but that's a different conversation to be had. So when we look at um, passing a challenge, all it comes down to is knowing your numbers and yep. keeping your risk at 0.25 or half a percent at each and every trade. This, this music to my ears. I preach this day in, day out. Yeah. Um, you, know, you get people reach out being like, these drawdowns are too tight. Well, no. you can adjust your trading to reach the drawdowns, to match the drawdowns. And yeah, so yeah. This, is, this is music to my ears to hear you reiterating the case, but I totally look, agree. A friend of mine, Tony Sycamore, um, mm -hmm. he's on Twitter. He's a Sydney boy. Um, so he, maybe you want to get him on his podcast and your podcast is amazing. Um, he used to trade as a prop trader for Goldman Sachs. Okay. And I speak to him a lot. Like, how was it at Goldman Sachs? And he's like, 6% drawdown, you're being kicked out, no questions asked. Mm -hmm. So what Goldman Sachs did with their traders is exactly the same how the prop firms now set up their challenges. So some have 4%, 5%. It doesn't matter, right? There is 6% is not so far from a 4% drawdown. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But what it is, what Goldman Sachs did, they said, you can have any training that you want, that you feel is going to help you. 
Um, what is also different when you um, trade in a, in a prop firm, and this is something that you guys create as well. So when you go into a prop firm and you learn in a prop firm, so this conversation I had with Tony, he already had people in the room who were just amazing. Like they would get their bonuses and would go down the road and buy from their bonuses a Ferrari. Mm -hmm. That caliber of traders. So they knew that it's actually possible. And I find a lot of retail traders, they, they ask me, is it really possible to make that much of money, that much money? Is it really possible to succeed in trading or is it all a scam? Mm -hmm. So they don't have any reference of what is possible and what not. Whereas when you learn in, in an institutional environment, you already have that. Yeah, you're right? surrounded by it. Yeah. Yeah, so you come in with a completely different mindset, a possibility mindset, because you see the proof. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and that can fall into motivational aspects that can fall into, I mean, a whole range. And that yeah. kind of leads me into a, a, a conversation topic I wanted to have as well, which which I was talking to a trader about, um, I think it was a couple of weeks ago, with that same aspect is, is it really possible can I get to these levels? Because they were driven or at least muffled by social media. Now, social yeah. media is an interesting one when it comes into trading because, I mean, you're, you're giggling already. We already know what it's like out there, um, YouTubers and whatever. It's very hard to cipher between, you know, who's really doing it, who's who's not doing it. But there is a lot of showcasing, a lot of showboating, a lot of, other ways to make money so, in there. I know a lot of the trainings of those YouTube educators because their clients then come to me and I'm like, mm -hmm. show me the training. And Baby Pips gives it for free. You don't yeah. even buy a $2,000 course from one of those YouTubers. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it's it's remarkable to me that, that it's still a thing. But um, it it's pulls people into that expectation that they see, you know, a, a young 18 year old driving a Lamborghini, um, yeah. making $50,000 a night trading Euro US dollar only. Um, mm -hmm. And you can follow it, his signals and, and whatever it might be. Um, that expectation when first people get in the market, because let's be real, most people get in the market because of the money aspect, they see yeah. that it looks easy. Um, you can make money, they know finance, they hear Wolf of Wall Street, they're like, oh yes, let's go. Um, and they get excited and filled into that. Do you see a, from a psychology point of view, a negative impact on maybe some of the beginners that you deal with on having that idea in the back of the mind that they should be at that level, but they're just not quite getting there? Mm. So I can relate to that because when I started trading, which is, you know, almost 20 years ago, um, <laughs> I had a very negative self image. I always felt like, you know, I'm, I can't do it. I'm not good enough. I'm, you know, will never be successful. And then I found trading. And for the first time, there was something in my life that I was not dependent on other people to judge me or to tell me if I'm good enough or not. Mm -hmm. And so I was working at Siemens at the time and I was working my butt off. And my colleague, who was like lazy as what yeah. <laughs> he got promoted and i didn't and i was heartbroken but it was a good thing because then i left mm -hmm. and 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 I, I decided i'm going to change my life i'm not going to put up with people deciding of what i can do and what i'm not capable of and um, that started a whole new journey for me but when i found trading i thought wow i can now become successful as well and then of course you know it was july i remember that and I thought by the end of the year, I'm going to have a Ferrari in my garage. I think and we all I'm fell for that. to show my family how they underestimated me. Mm -hmm. But seven years later, <laughs> I had yeah. finally, you know, started working through all the childhood drama and, <laughs> you know, my neuroticism. And I was finally able to actually start my trading journey because you have to imagine when you had a traumatic upbringing, what happens for most children is they get emotionally, um, I think the word is disturbed. I think it's a little bit too, too strong disturbed, but they get emotionally impacted in such a way that their rational, logical thinking doesn't work. And that's why so many children, there's nothing wrong with them in terms of intellect, in terms of IQ, but they can't do well at school 
because of this this um, trauma stress. Mm, okay. And they can't process um, mathematics or languages. And it's the same for traders. So if they had if they're highly neurotic and they read some sort of trading analysis or try to learn a new um, a, a new strategy, they literally can't process that in their brain until the trauma is being healed. And then the trauma is healed and doesn't need to be like a big healing session. It can be, you know, done really um, and gentle and, and can be a progress of healing. When they have this healing, they go back to watching or studying that strategy. They're like, why didn't I get it the first time? It's so clear to me. It's like common sense. Mm. Yeah. So um, that's that's something that we need to distinguish between um, traders who have had that experience. Now, these kind of people get attracted to trading because they think they have to do it and can do it on their own because the experience with other people was so painful. Interesting. So you see a lot of like kind of lone wolves get attracted yeah. to, to trading because of that aspect of, of you know, it's me, myself, and I, and, and I can do it myself. Yeah. And then there's, of course, the others that you described who see the glory of trading and, you know, and the girls and yeah. um, the money and, and the, the cars and, and so on. Yeah. And get um, swept in through that. that. That's a different pull. But we can all agree that trading attracts a certain kind of human being at Absolutely. the beginning. And then the uh, fork in the road starts. You realize that you only lose money and then you start saying, either I stop, do something else, or I learn what's going on with me. And then the person development journey starts. Yep, yep. And, yeah. and I think personally, you have to lose money in order to get anywhere in trading. I think you, we were talking about this in the, in the last episode with with Michael Katz, um, who's a big trader over at Trade the Pool, and he we were talking about our biggest ever losses, and mm. that when you do endeavor these big losses, it physically hurts. Oh, like you yeah. feel that pain. You throw up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's horrible. Um, yeah. But we were discussing that we. I'm so glad it did happen because I would never make that same mistake again. Because if I even just think about it, I'm a little bit like, whoa. <laughs> Yeah, because I'd... it forced you to look at yourself. Exactly. Yeah. I, I am working with a trader at the moment who did like well for, you know, two or three years and then um, suddenly lost $1.5 million and back to nothing, right? Physically ill and then trying to recover the money, of course, right? That's the next yeah. step throwing more money blowing more accounts and trying to get back on on his feet and, and just couldn't because we underestimate what the trauma that is mm -hmm. that's that's ptsd that these guys go through and the trauma needs to be healed first and, and again it's not a big deal when I, mean, I say the trauma needs to be healed first it's not like a massive session it's just mm -hmm. dealing with the emotions that come up and sorting them in your mind and making sense of what did actually happen yeah yeah, I agree. And it, it is mental, some of those those big losses that we face and, and how we recuperate. And we, we were talking about it. It took us weeks to get back in the market. So, um, I've seen some people never recover, as you say. Yeah. It, it gets an issue that I think a lot of people, especially given how accessible internet prop firms are these days um mm. a lot of people are making the jump they don't even go to retail accounts they're going straight into prop firm and learning to trade at prop firm accounts and i don't know how i feel about that or how i sit by that because i came up through retail trading and i wouldn't have got to the level of consistency that i managed to if i hadn't have felt the pain of losing that account and actually losing my money um, whereas if we go to prop firm, okay, I could lose like $200, sure, and I technically blew a 24K account or whatever it might have been. Um, but when I was trading, you know, $10,000, $20,000 on my own personal account and I'd lose five, dollars $6,000, that would be like, oh, okay, this kind of hurts. <laughs> and then it would make me enforce and make me realize why risk management is so strict in a proprietary trading firm. Um, what is your take on that? Do you think people getting into the market, maybe in their early days, where do you find that most people make breakthroughs sooner? Do you think retail trading works? Do you think 
learning in institutions, as you said, some people go straight through to like Goldman Sachs and learn that way. Um, internet prop firms. Do you see maybe a pattern on the more successful traders on where they come from? This is really hard to say because if we now look at the institutions, uh, professional prop firms like you know, Goldman Sachs, um, mm -hmm. they're not operating anymore after 2008, um, Frank, um, Dot Frank um, ruling. Um, or very, uh, they have a very stringent, uh, stringent um, selection process. And they already filter out the guys who will not make it. Mm -hmm. And the guys who they thought would make it, but don't make it, they're out within a few months. They already see that. So we don't know how many people apply for those jobs and then actually don't make it through. Mm -hmm. So we don't have any, have any data on that. Um, retail, again, it's the same. We don't have enough data. I mean, we know that 90% of traders are failing, even though they say now it's 75%. But I think there's a little bit of... Um, 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 broker pushed in that number. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, so we don't know what the numbers are, but the thing is, you you can lie to yourself because no one sees your accounts. Mm -hmm. Now, when you look at the prop firms now, I know traders who have spent ten thousand dollars, and not just one trader, like a lot of traders. Uh, when I say a lot, I'm, I mean I personally know like six or seven have spent several thousand dollars on those challenges. Mm -hmm. But then there's another way of avoiding responsibility, because as you said, you know, I can say in my mind, oh, it's just another $200, but they're avoiding to actually go into the real market with their own money and face that pain. Mm -hmm. So when they're in the online prop firm, they can always say, well, I didn't make it because their risk management is too strong, too strict. It's their fault. Yeah. Or someone said to me, well, I want to prove to myself that I can make it in a prop firm. And until I make it in a prop firm, I will, I will not trade my own account. And then I said to him, so what's the expectancy of your um, strategy? And, you know, blank, look, I said, what's the number of um, um, losing trades and winning trades in a row? Blank, look. Yeah. So it doesn't matter where you start, prop firm, your own retail account institutions again are different that you have a different start there they start mm -hmm. slowly if you don't know your numbers you will not succeed and you and i we both know that most don't know their numbers they don't know how to go about um setting themselves up for success for that prop firm they do exactly what you were saying they're like oh online prop firms just 200 dollars. i'm not wasting much money or i don't have much money and then they get hooked, they lose their $200. And then the same happens like in trading, they go on tilt, prop firm trading. Yeah. I want my $200 back, let's do another challenge. Oh, now it's $400, I want another challenge. Yeah. And in no time they're in $10,000. So the tilting behavior is exactly the same. It's just now the fee that they pay for the prop firm. Interesting, <laughs> it's interesting. It's a different, different um, outlook. Going into that, knowing your numbers, uh, absolutely. Uh, if you don't know your numbers, you shouldn't be taking any type of restriction challenge of, of any kind, in my opinion, because how do you know where to position yourself and how do you know whether yeah. it's possible in the first place? You know, there's, there's some firms, they have a whole different out in the industry, different requirements. And I know for a fact, the whole reason I, I got, in case you didn't know, I got funded at the Fivers before uh, becoming an analyst at the Fivers. So I was already a, a funded trader there. Yeah. Um, the fivers was the only one that realistically I looked at and went, yes, I can, I can get through that. The, the expectation of, of profit targets across the market were a little bit too high out of my numbers. I would have had to gamble a little bit um, and essentially hope for the best. So I had to rein that in and, and get an understanding of whether or not I was able to pass it. I deal with some traders that reach out um, and asking for help in the analyst meetings. And some of them don't even have trading journals or any type of mm -hmm. statistical run through where they can actually look back on their trades or they can predict looking forward of any kind. Do you, when it comes down to trading journals, I'm big on trading journals. I've, I've got like a six sheet spreadsheet, um, tracking everything from emotions to P and L to, to what the setups look like. Is it something you run through with your traders as well? Do you see benefits in trading journals? 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, the, the, the negative aspect of trading journals that I see is that a lot of traders use it just as a brain dump and to whinge and complain about themselves. Mm -hmm. And um, because it's just like half an hour brain dumping, which has its place, okay, or heart dumping or out crying. Yeah. Um, but then there's nothing that they can filter for in order to get feedback on how many times they made that mistake. And so I see a lot of traders that come to me with that kind of journaling. I'm like, that's not journaling, that's whinging, mm -hmm. right? not helping. Um, makes you feel better in the moment, but it doesn't help you to change your behavior. So um, I, it depends on what kind of trader I'm dealing with. When I have someone who's highly neurotic and thinks there's something wrong with them, I tend to step away from them um, journaling their emotions because they already do that so much. Right? All they talk about is their emotions, now they got annoyed and, and um, how they are losers. So I want to balance that out. And often the traders would hyper emotional so neurotic um they don't have access to logical thinking that goes back to what i was saying before some sort of trauma they can't think logically mm -hmm. with those guys i ditch emotional um journaling completely and i get them onto statistics metrics you know what we just said number of losing trades in a row number of profits in a row profit factor don't worry about your profit loss ratio I saw some of your guys when I did my research for today. Uh, one guy had like a 30, 70 win loss ratio. Mm -hmm. So he lost 70%, but his equity curve, beautiful, smooth. Yeah. By the way, Tony Sycamore's equity curve, I saw that. Beautiful, smooth as well. Half a percent stop loss. Mm -hmm. Here's this big guy, right? Half a percent stop loss, no wild swings. Yeah. Um, I also asked um, Alba Capital, so was, um, Steve Deacon, on, um, so Alba Capital on Twitter, mm -hmm. he traded for Paul Tudor Jones, and I asked him, so what was it like in terms of risk management? Guess what Paul Tudor Jones says? 5%. 5% risk? Or a 5% max drawdown overall? Max drawdown. Oh, right, yep, yep. Sorry, yeah. I misunderstood that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But it's the same thing like a prop firm. So, mm. um, um, again, these guys have a different setup. They have... Um, a different mindset. They have much more information to work with. But when it comes to risk, prop firms are not doing anything out of the ordinary. Mm -hmm. right? So when I have someone who's highly cut off from their emotions, and they only, you know, they they um, trace their um, performance stats, like you know, become obsessive about it, then I add the emotional statistics. How did you feel in that moment? I don't know. What do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so next right. time you have this kind of losing trade, I want you to email me straight away. Where in your body do you feel a reaction? Is it in your head, in your shoulders, in your chest, in your tummy, in your solar plexus, in your legs? Where is it? And they're like, I have no idea what you're talking about. So we need to get them in touch with their emotions because emotions, and I have an article on that on my website, like for 10 years already, I don't know. Um, emotional guidance system our emotions our friends wanting to tell us what we can do to improve mm -hmm. but these guys are completely shut off so it's the other extreme um, that's it's fascinating to me that, you, that you've mentioned that because that's something i've always preached when when chatting to traders is, is the the going back to the gurus out there always treat you to shut off emotion stop feeling you know remove emotion from the equation and I personally don't think that's a healthy thing to, to try and do, um, but rather listen and become one with your emotions. Yeah. They, they're, they're trying to signal something. You won't be able to know what it is just yet. You need the statistics to back that up. Um, but they are essentially trying to tell you something, and I, I think you should listen to them. So it's interesting that, that you do the same way once you get past if it's for the right trader, um, that yeah, emotions are, are messages. They're not, they're not trying to hurt your trading. They're actually, you can use them as, as a tool to help your trading. And you really need to distinguish between who is preaching that. Mm. If it is someone who's coming from a professional background, they have been taught because no one like successful people don't want to hear you whinge. Mm -hmm. 
they want to hear you talk possibility. So if you listen to Linda Rushke um, talking, she always talks possibility. Uh, she is never caught in the past. Mm -hmm. And um, and she's also dealing with her losses the same way. I don't want to drag that negative energy around with me. I cut them so I can move on. If you take a losing trade, so I'm talking about the bad losing trade, not mm -hmm. one that are normal, into the next day, that skews your ability to think clearly. And you miss out on amazing trades and you dig yourself a bad you know, yeah. hole and you can't get out of it. So cut it, get on with it and create a new future. That's always how she talks. She never dwells on what she did wrong and how she was, you know, um, how she did that mistake and what a loser she is because she did my mistake. Never. She's like, damn it, I made this mistake. And and she doesn't even swear much, right? She's just like, damn it, I made this mistake. And then, you know, half an hour later, it's forgotten. She's already focused on the future. Now, that is a skill that can be learned, but it's actually already something that's inherent in us. So when we do a Myers-Briggs or a DISC profile, um, we can see, and I do that with my traders a lot, so I can cut down the coaching hours. Like, mm -hmm. you know, I want to set my traders free. I don't want to have them hanging off my skirts too, too long. I like my <laughs> freedom. And I don't want to have a big group that I'm working with. I want to work with just, you know, a few selected traders um, because I have so many other things. I want to trade and enjoy my life and not mm -hmm. run a coaching practice but um so the thing is that we can cut down using those um assessments like as at my bricks and, and disc and and um, oh, um the big five right um the positive thinking one they are the ones that i usually use and when i have a trader who has a certain um, outcome with those tests i already know um, they are stuck in the past. They they have a mistake. They make a mistake. They get super annoyed with themselves. They go into the self-destructive self-loathing, and they can't get out of that. They just think about what they missed out on and how they screwed up. And then there's others who easily shift their um, focus back forwards to the future and leave that mistake in the past. They don't need to talk about it. They don't need to work through it, what they did wrong. Mm -hmm. And so when you know that you are someone who gets caught up in the past, usually it's the ones who are on the neurotic side, wow. you can practice shifting your view to the future and leaving the mistakes in the past. So how that looks like is someone who makes a mistake, who lives in the past, wants to fix that mistake. I was in a profit. I'm a week away from passing my prop challenge, I've been doing really well. I made the stupid loss. I need to fix that. Mm. Otherwise, I might fail the challenge and I, all my dreams go up into hot air. And trader who is looking to the future is like, damn it, I made this mistake. It wasn't really what I was supposed to do, but that's okay. I have another week. I know I'll do better. Mm -hmm. I just need to follow my strategy, what I did in the last three weeks, and then I'll pass. Interesting. Yeah, so you see the difference in thinking mm -hmm. and feeling. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And do you, how would you go into helping someone who is stuck in the past? Yeah, so it all starts with language. The only thing that we have control about is our language. And so our language, which is a self-talk, and also what we communicate out loud, is um, closely related with our feelings, how we feel, and both together then determine the actions we take. So when I have a trader who's like, I'm such an idiot, um, how could I? Back to that negative self-image yeah. piling up. Yeah. Yep. Then I explain to them what you're doing is you keep describing the past, blocking off the future. What you want to do is you want to describe a new future. Okay, so you made this mistake. Say it out loud once because it needs to come out, right? It's like a pimple. It needs to get mm -hmm. out. Um, and now what you do, once you have said it once, then you know what's also interesting is they then go and tell the whole world about it. They go shopping with it. And they keep people hostage with their drama mm -hmm. conversations. When you have that in your room, shut it down straight away because it drags everyone down. 
go into possibility thinking, I made this mistake. So what can I do about this? Right? What can I do to um, um, improve that conversation? Simple, Good. Right? It's, it's kind of that, that outlook of everything's an opportunity. Everything's yeah. an opportunity. Be op- opportunistic when you have these type of things. Okay, it happened. Let's move from now. And it's kind of like a, a business management point of view. It's like, okay, yeah. yes, we this happened. It doesn't matter. It is what it is. How do we move on? How do we progress? How do like what's next? Um, and same, you you think the same thing is very beneficial in in trading? Yeah, absolutely. I would say if you could have done better, you would have done better. So if you had the series of losses, simply means that you could not have done better. So let's have a look at that. Interesting. So that's where I start with the thinking. I need them to start taking responsibility. Mm. And then, you know, again, it depends on um, looking at so what emotions are um, prevalent. So when you have, for example, the emotions in the solar plexus, that is always the fear of losing control. So that's coming from a kinesiologist. Um, if you have the feelings in your chest, that is, um, sorry, other way around. Solar plexus is not feeling good enough. When the feelings are in the chest, upper chest, then... Um, it's feedback that we feel fear of losing control. So already when I know where those feelings are sitting in the body, I can make a very educated guess of what happened and the direction where we have to go. So I was working with a trader yesterday, doing the prop firm challenge three times. He passed once, Mm -hmm. three times. He's blowing up in the last week. And um, stuff happens like, his platform freezing, um, computer having a meltdown, he needs to buy a new computer and he's in a position, the problem he's with, he doesn't have um, access on his phone. So mm-hmm. the only way for him to manage positions to call into, um, so he's in Europe, but the only way to call is uh, call into America and um, like, or, you know, do it on the, on the computer. So mm-hmm. he couldn't manage his position, bombed out. Um, so then he gets really super angry and he's been from coach to coach to coach and improved a lot. But then I, I, I think I got to the results so quick with him because he had done all the work already. Mm. But if I had started with him from scratch, it would have been several sessions. But so then I said to, I asked him questions and every time he gave me a really super defined answer. And I said to him, look, dude, you are not letting me do my job. You're controlling the conversation and you, you know, you don't, um, you don't allow vulnerability. Mm. So that tells me that in the past, when you grew up, allowing vulnerability was dangerous. You were at risk and something happened to you that, um, you then lost your trust in people. And he was like, oh, okay. <laughs> and then I said, okay. Again, let's try again. When you have this happening, what's coming up for you? What feeling? And he immediately said sadness. Before it was like all these defined answers like, um, yeah, I feel like I'm not good enough and um, I feel like I'm screwing up my future. And I knew that was just bullshit. He was feeding me. Mm. He didn't know he was feeding me bullshit though. Yeah. It's automatic protective mechanism. And I said, sadness, I actually feel grief. I said, did you lose someone really dear to you? He said, yes, I lost my grandfather. And that was the beginning of mayhem in my life. Outstanding. And so on PTSD trauma. That's outstanding. It's remarkable how, how deep and how many different levels yeah. can affect performance yeah. in a whole range of areas. And it is, it is yeah. great to, to have a chat with you and, and share some of that knowledge. If traders wanted to, to have a session with you or wanted to reach out, where would they go to reach you? Um, Best on Twitter, um, MPX underscore. I'll trader. put it in the description too. <laughs> okay, great. Twitter, yeah. <laughs> or through my website. Uh, I have two website trading websites, tradingpsychology.com.au and um, highperformancetrading.com.au. Um, I moved to high performance trading. As I said, I changed my coaching approach. Mm-hmm. Um, but I have trading psychology since 2006 now. 
And, and there's some trolls on Twitter and like, you are not a psychologist. Why do you have this website? And I'm like, oh God. There's always, right? so, there's always some. There's always some. What's next for you, Mandy? Where, where's where's Mandy in, in both that, obviously I know you still trade as much as possible when you can. Um, yeah. Where's your trading career taking you? Where's your trading coaching? What, what's next for you? Yeah, that's a really good question. I, I feel like um, um, I want to cut back on coaching a little and um so i'm going in january hopefully over to linda's and um then we're running some trainings together so on, on a bigger scale mm-hmm. um, depending on what COVID does and you know what the ukrainian war does and yeah. so on um i um also work with some phenomenal traders who want to get their programs out there and i just i, I just love those guys mm-hmm. Um, because they're the real deal. So I'm, I'm helping them. Um, that is very rewarding for me. Um, so doing podcasts. Um, yeah, I mean, I hope that the world is going to normalize again a little more so that I can go back to my normal routine, spending most of my life in Australia and then three months in summer over in Europe with my family. Oh, but, um yeah, I think at the moment everything is just so uncertain for everyone. I just go with the flow and see uh, what opportunities are coming up. It's the best way to be opportunistic in this yeah. time. There's there's crazy things going on. There's uh, yeah, no, that that's that's wonderful though. I, I really appreciate you taking the time to have a chat with me today and, and sharing your knowledge and expertise with with all the traders. I can imagine a lot of people would have taken a lot of positive points and potentially even a different outlook what they haven't seen before looking at that emotional and psychological side away from from the technicals and trading so i just wanted to say a big thank you from all of us for for tuning in and 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 sharing your expertise with us today thank you so much for having me cheers you've been listening to traders of money the podcast that helps you better understand the financial markets become a better trader better investor and be more profitable Traders of Money is brought to you by Trade Delicious. Join your host, Jordan Mellor, next time on Traders of Money.